Any questions or comments? Uh, so in the verse where it's talking about Prophet Adam having the spirit being blown into him and Bibi Maryam having the spirit being blown into her, what is the difference between those two verses? Because in one verse, it's referring to Prophet Adam's creation, like the the person itself who's being created effectively yeah. is having the spirit blown into them. Yeah. And in the other, it's the child. So that, that, that is the exact, uh, you know, difference with, with Adam, the, the ruh that was blown to him, blown into him, gave him life. Whereas the ruh that was blown into Maryam gave life to that, uh, that child that will grow in within her. So the ruh that was breathed into Adam gave Adam life. So he was just a physical entity, and now he is a living, he's a living entity. With Maryam, the ruh that was blown into her was not to give her life, she's already alive, but it's to infuse life in, in her womb. It's to create that uh, that conception, to give life to Isa alayhi salam. Now, normally for life to be created inside a human being, inside a woman, there has to be the, uh, the zygote, the, the union between the sperm and the egg. This happened through the, through the agency of the ruh. So is the, linguistically in those, those two verses of the Quran, is there any difference that would kind of imply that a different person is being targeted? So let me look at the uh, the ayah. Fanafakhna fiha. No, it's it's the same. Fanafakhna fiha. And if you look at uh, so Allah says we we breathed into her our spirit. And if you look at the verse about Adam, Allah subhanahu wa taala says wanafakhtu fihi. So in both cases, the spirit was blown into them. Now, when we say blown into them, again, the, the ruh is not a physical thing. So, but the, the language is, is pretty much exactly the same. That the, the, the spirit was breathed into him, into Adam, it gave him life, and it was breathed into Maryam, and it, it created this additional life within her, which is the life of, uh, of Isa as a, as a fetus. But there's there's no linguistic clue that would make that distinction. Thank you. Alaikum wa rahmatullah. You gave the reference of uh, Imam Imam Salih about the rule and its analogy. Yeah. Uh, comparing it with wind, mm -hmm. that's how smooth and easy flowing it is. And in Surah Al Waqiyah, uh, Ayat 83, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Falola ida balabatil kulkum, ba antum ki naidin tantu." So when it reaches the throat of the dying person. And at that moment, you're looking on, and we are nearer to him than you are, though you do not perceive. Then why do you not, if you are uh, not, uh, restore it, if you are truthful? Mm -hmm. So what is uh, the explanation of this? And what is it that uh, which gets stuck in the throat? And then people around that dying person, watching that person helplessly, and then Allah says that, uh, why don't you bring back that uh, if you are truthful? So if a guru is so, no, yes. it's like wind and it flows easily, and it moves easily. So what is this? No, no, uh, no. <laughs> so you, you're referring to ayah number 83. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, now we know from the ahadith that the way that the soul is removed and extracted from the body, we have we have a hadith that mentioned that for the mu'mineen, 
it's drawn a certain way and for the, the kufar and the mujrimin it's drawn a different way. But generally the, when, the, when the, the soul reaches the throat, that is an indication that the human being is just about to die, meaning that the soul is going to depart and the person is now entering alam al So falawla idha balaghat al is really the, the last stage of the naz, the extraction of the soul. And this is also the point that the, where the Imams speak about, where the Ahadith indicate that you have up until this point to make tawbah. Right? So the door of tawbah is open until the throat, the soul reaches the throat, meaning the moment right before a person is going to die. So when Allah says, فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذَنْ تَنْظُرُونَ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُبْصُرُونَ فَلَوْلَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ غَيْرَ مَدِينِينَ And then why is it not, if you were not held under authority, تَرْجِعُونَهَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ That it, you claim to have power, you claim to be you know, people of strength, people of technology, whatever you want to call it. If you have all of these capabilities, why can't you send back the soul? But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that the, the extraction of the soul is not something that you can do anything about. That this is being managed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the, the angels of death. So even though the, the ruh is, moves without uh, restriction, that doesn't mean that it's not under the command of God. Now, for example, when we sleep, our ruh is more active. That's why we see we see dreams. So there's a partial connection between the soul and the body when we when we sleep. So if you look at the connection between the soul and the body, you, there's a when we're awake and alive. When we're alive and awake, that's full connection between the body and the soul. When we are alive and asleep, there's a partial connection, which is why we see dreams. The ruh is active, it's moving to those higher realms. When we die, that's when the connection is severed. And then, as the hadith mentioned, it's attached to a, uh, a mithali body. But these verses are, are essentially talking about our inability to send the, the soul back into the body after it has reached this point and the, and the soul is about to depart. This is a very technical discussion. So the Quran is very clear that it's the nafs that uh, that tastes death. The you see the ruh predates the body, right? We were arwah before we were physical beings. You know, for example, in in alam al dhar you can say that we were arwah. We were spirits even before our physical births. Now the nafs. How does the nafs come into play? Now, when the ruh doesn't have a body, it really, you know, so when, when the ruh is joined with the body, the nafs, the nafs is born. So nafs can only exist if there is a ruh and there is body. So if I, if I do things, which only cater to my physical body, and I ignore the needs of the, the ruh, I'm going to develop what? Nafsul ammara. But if I am a person who nur nourishes and looks after the needs of the ruh, I'll become what? Nafsul mutma'inna. So the, the nafs is essentially born out of the interaction between the ruh and the uh, and the body and this is something that needs an entire lecture in and of its own but uh, but yeah so the the 
the nafs the nafs comes into existence through the uh, the body and then uh, when it develops its its own identity it separates so the the nafs needs the body initially but then with death it becomes independent from the body and then it becomes attached to a lighter body which is called the mithali body so that that's in a nutshell so the ruh doesn't doesn't taste uh, death because it pre-existed the physical body and it has it, it it never needed the physical body whereas the nafs needed it and it was dependent on it and now it is is transitioning to another phase of its existence whereby it doesn't need the body anymore so it has to taste that the separation from this heavy physical body and then it goes to the mithali body in alam al barzakh I have a question. Sorry, uh, Sheikh, when uh, after the burial, the first night, when uh, the body is brought back to life for interrogation by uh, the two angels, one pair and the peer, is, is it the nafs or the ruh which joins the body or both? Now, when we say that it joins the body, of course, we're not talking about the uh, the physical body. It's uh, you know this is a misconception to think that the the person is physically revived in their grave. What it means is that it's uh, it's the the mithali body that uh, that it joins with. So this the uh, it's the nafs. That is uh, that is joined with uh, the Nithali body. Um, one question uh, someone's asking: uh, yeah. Is there a process of evolution in the development of the final uh, Islamic Sharia of the Prophet Muhammad? And if so, or if not, then what was the divine intent to not reveal the Quran or final Sharia to Prophet Adam or Noah or Ibrahim, since that would avoid the development of different religions and different friction in their belief? Can you repeat the first part of the question? Uh, the first part was, is there a process of evolution in the development of the final Islamic Sharia? So of, it did it evolve over time, I believe. Did Islam evolve over time? Uh, I, it's more like the, the revelation, the, the Sharia that was revealed to Muhammad, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, evolved over time. So when it comes to the, the Sharia of the uh, the Prophet, we can't say that it's, it evolved over time, but rather there are aspects of it that were clarified with the passing of time. So there are certain things that People, for example, during the time of the Prophet, they, they weren't ready to understand, their minds weren't prepared to understand, and they were later expounded on, expounded and clarified by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And in fact, we have a hadith that say that Surat al Ikhlas was revealed for people at the end of times because their minds and their intellects will be much more developed. So there are things that will be uncovered about the Qur'an that are concealed from us today. And, and that will happen as humanity matures and as, as we become more refined in our understanding. So from that aspect, there is there's an evolution in the way that we understand the, uh, the Qur'an. It's not that the religion itself is, is changing. Now, as for the, the question about why didn't God just reveal one religion to uh, to Adam, it, it goes back to the, the comment that I made that the you know human being. So just as the human being develops, humanity also go, goes through stages of development. And during the time of Adam السلام, because you know human life was relatively primitive, and there were only a handful of people in existence at the time, there was no need for a comprehensive you know, code of, of conduct. So as humanity develops, the sharia becomes more sophisticated and it becomes more involved. 
So, for example, if you look at the, if you look at Adam, you know, other than, you know, the belief in the oneness of God and some, you know, moral directives, there wasn't this elaborate code of conduct that governs human interaction because it was not needed. There were only a handful of people. You know, there was no penal code, for example. There, you know, so these laws later on developed as, as the population grew and as new issues and new problems started to surface. So it, it would have been unjust for God to reveal something so sophisticated to a people who were very primitive in their understanding. Now, Adam, of course, is a prophet, but the others, it, it would have been unneeded. It would have been unnecessary for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reveal something that's so involved and intricate and nuanced to a society that was really very primitive. Uh, thank you. And another question, uh, did Bibi Maryam have any other children? So we don't know. We have no, we have no uh, narrations that confirm that she even got married. It's, it's very possible that she, she lived the life of, uh, of complete celibacy. Now, I know that's not, that contradicts the biblical accounts, but we have no narrations or a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt that mentioned that she even got married, let alone have children. But uh, the, only, the only child that she had through miraculous conception was Isa alayhi that we know of, of course. All right, thank you very much, Sheikh. We will continue, bi'ithnillah, if you guys are still up to it. Okay. Please keep in your dog. Likewise. Thank you very much.